Continuing with Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life. Rule number 10, be precise in your speech. Uh, this is the second section of rule number 10, and it's titled, Tools, Obstacles, and Extension into the World. We assume that we see objects or things we look at at the world, but that's not really how it is. Our evolved perceptual systems transform the interconnected, complex, multi-level world that we inhabit, not so much into things per se, as into useful things or their nemesis, things that get in the way. This is the necessary practical reduction of the world. This is the transformation of the near infinite complexity of things through the narrow specification of our purpose. This is how precision makes the world sensibly manifest. This is not at all the same as perceiving objects. We don't see valueless entities and then attribute meaning to them. We perceive the meaning directly. We see floors to walk on and doors to duck through and chairs to sit on. It's for this reason that a beanbag and a stump both fall into the latter category despite having little objectivity in common. We see rocks because we can throw them and clouds because they can rain on us and apples to eat and the automobiles of other people to get in our way and annoy us. We see tools and obstacles, not objects or things. Furthermore, we see tools and obstacles the handy level of analysis that makes them most useful or dangerous given our needs, abilities, and perceptual limitations. The world reveals itself to us as something to utilize and something to navigate through, not as something that merely is. It's pretty profound. <clears throat> we see the faces of the people we are talking to because we need to communicate with these people and cooperate with them. We don't see their microcosmic structures, their cells, or their subcellular organelles, molecules, and atoms that make up those cells. We don't see as well the macroism that surrounds them, the family members and friends that make up their immediate social circles, the economies that they are embedded within, or the ecology that contain all of them. Finally, and equally importantly, we don't see them across time. We see them in the narrow, immediate, overwhelming now, instead of surrounded by the yesterdays and tomorrows that may be a more important part of them than whatever is currently and obviously manifested. And we have to see them this way, or we'd be overwhelmed. When you see an elderly person, they haven't always been elderly. You don't know the person or anything, you're just walking around, you see something, you're like, oh, that person's in their 70s or 80s. That person used to be a teenager, that person used to be in their 20s, used to be in their 30s. They're not anymore. Doesn't matter how much money they have or where they're from. That's life, that's how it goes. Life, one thing's for sure. Nobody gets out alive. I just want to stop here to say, if you haven't already, click the thumbs up button, hit the subscribe button, because like I said, this is life, and nobody gets out alive. Okay, back to the reading. This is true even for our perceptions of ourselves or of our individual persons. We assume that we end at the surface of our skin because of the way we were perceived. But we can understand with a little thought the provisional nature of that boundary. We shift what is inside our skin, so to speak, as the context we inhabit changes. Even when we do something as apparently simple as picking up a screwdriver, our brain automatically adjusts what it considers our body to include the tool. We can literally feel things with the end of the screwdriver. When we extend a hand holding the screwdriver, we automatically take the length of the ladder into account. That's so true. We can probe nukes and crannies with its extended end and comprehend what we are exploring. Furthermore, we instantly regard the screwdriver we are holding as our screwdriver and get possessive about it. We do the same with the much more complex tools we use in much more complex situations. The cars we pilot instantaneously and automatically become ourselves. Because of this, when somebody bangs his fist on our car's hood after we have irritated him in a crosswalk, we take it personally. <laughs> this is not always reasonable. Nonetheless, Without the extension of our self into a machine, it would be impossible to drive. I've never um, ha suffered from that affliction, considering the uh, automobile and extension of myself. <clears throat> I have been in crosswalks, however, and banged somebody's car for getting too close for me. And I do remember how upset the person became on each occasion. The extendable boundaries of ourselves also expand to include other people, family members, lovers, and friends. A mother will sacrifice for her children. Is our father or son or wife or husband more or less integral to us than an arm or a leg? We can answer in part by asking, 
Which would we rather lose? Would we rather sacrifice more to avoid? We practice for such permanent extension, such permanent commitment by identifying with the fictional characters of books and movies. Their tragedies and triumphs rapidly and convincingly become ours. Sitting still in our seats, we nonetheless act out a multitude of alternate realities, extending ourselves experimentally, testing multiple p potential paths before specifying the one that we'll actually take. Engrossed in a fictional world, we can even become things that don't really exist. In the blink of an eye, in the magic hall of the movie theater, we become fat, fantastical creatures. We sit in the dark before rapidly flickering images become witches, superheroes, aliens, vampires, lions, elves, or wooden marionettes. We feel everything they feel and are peculiarly happy to pay for the privilege, even when what we experience is sorrow, fear, or horror. You know, that is so funny. I, I don't go to the movies, but like that is kind of what it is. The people that go to the movies, they all go there and they turn off the lights and everybody's like, it's imagination time. Like, like oh, I'm a witch. I'm a doctor. I'm a blah, 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 blah. Or, or like women, like, oh, I'm in a funny relationship with a handsome person, you know? Like, it's so like hilarious. Like, everybody's doing their own like thing. Uh, it's so sad, too. But anyways. Something similar, but more extreme, happens when we identify not with a character in a fictional drama, but with the whole group in a competition. What is talking about sports? This is what happens when a favorite team wins or loses an important game against an arch rival. This is so true. Uh, there's sports, you know, I'm guilty of from San Antonio, Texas, and I like the San Antonio Spurs, but there's a direct correlation between people who are unsuccessful and people that like sports. Sports, have, sports usually have no relative to the person watching them. There's no reason to cheer your heart out. It, have, it has no meaning or basis in your own life unless you have money on it or you're a team owner or something like that. With university teams, I can understand. I went to the University of Texas, so they usually have a really good basketball and football team. Uh, with that, it has some relevance in my life, but not much. Okay, the winning goal will bring the whole network of fans to their feet before they think in an unscripted unison. It is as if their many nervous systems are directly wired to the game unfolding in front of them. Fans take the victories and defeats of their teams very personally, even wearing the jerseys of their heroes, often celebrating their wins and losses more than such events that actually occur in their day-to-day -day lives. This identification manifests itself deeply, even biochemically and neurologically. Vicarious experiences of winning and losing, for example, raise and lower testosterone levels among fans participating in the context. Our capacity for identification is something that manifests itself at the very level of our being. I think of uh, you know college sports in the South, college football is huge, and you see all those big uh, stadiums. They sell more tickets than the NFL. There's like 100,000 people. And you look in the student section, there's always like beautiful co-ed young girls all crying their hearts out if their team isn't winning. But like deep down, they don't even know the rules of football. Like there's no reason to cry like that or to act like it has any significance in your day-to-day -day life. Um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm getting off of uh, sports myself. I only used to, I, I, there was a few years where I watched football. It was a waste of my life. But uh, basketball now, I don't normally watch the games anymore because um, they have them all condensed onto YouTube like 10 minutes after the game is over with. Um, the whole game will be condensed into like a 10-minute thing. And you don't need to see like every play, every foul call, every loose ball. You know, they take every important play of the game and they condense it into a 10-minute thing. And I haven't seen that with football, but it would make more sense with football because in football, American football, the action is only like three minutes. They do do that with soccer. It's like 90 minutes and 90 seconds. And so I've been watching a lot of World Cup games in 90 uh, seconds compared to 90 minutes. And it saves me a lot of time. Uh, you hear some sports stories. Uh, they're saying like, oh, attendance at the NFL is down and viewership is down on all sports across the board and it may have to do with the people the players not standing for the national anthem like no it has to do with people like wising up and technology um, showing just how smart and productive people can be so. okay fans okay to the degree that we are patriotic so similarly our country is not just important to us it is us we might even sacrifice our entire smaller individual selves in battle to maintain the integrity of our country. For much of our history, such willingness to die has been regarded as something admirable and courageous as part of human duty. Human duty. 
Paradoxically, that is a direct consequence, not of our aggression, but of our extreme sociability and willingness to cooperate. We, we, if we can become not only ourselves, but our families, teams, and countries, cooperation comes easily to us, relying on the same deeply innate mechanisms that drive us and other creatures to protect our very bodies. Um, I've been watching the World Cup re recently, and I like that a lot because there's a lot of subplots. You know, it, um, I, uh, to the school that I work at, uh, a couple of the students are soccer fans, so I talk about the World Cup because there's 32 countries. You know, I can help them find the countries. There's all these like side stories, all these like other stories going around, and there's the sense about national pride. What he was just talking about that last chapter. Uh, like today, England finally won a World Cup knockout game uh, in penalty kicks, and that was really exciting. Um, one of the few players that I know for England, uh, he plays on a team called the Tottenham Spurs. And as I mentioned earlier in this video, uh, the sports team that I always grew up cheering for was the San Antonio Spurs. So um, them being on uh, the same name, uh, I'm familiar with them. But that was from uh, Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules from Life. Uh, that rule, rule number 10, be precise in your speech. And uh, that section was called Tools, Obstacles, and Extension into the World. Uh, my name is Gregory Brandt. I also am a writer and a teacher. Uh, my book is called Gonzo Education. And uh, there's a video of me reading that book on this channel. Thanks for watching. Have a nice day. Thank <laughs> you.